Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Specifying Practice Group Call for CSI. Um, and lastly, I want to introduce our co-chairs, Dave and Lewis. Dave and Lewis, uh, I'm not sure if you have any introduction officially for Brock or any other additional information you'd like to add to the group, but I'll hand it over to you at this point to get started with today's session. Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, th this is Lewis. This is Dave. And, I'm coming uh, to you. Welcome. Yeah, go ahead, Lewis. <laughs> I'm coming to you from sunny downtown Nashville. Um, and the year before last, at the uh, 2013 um, convention, was here in beautiful downtown Nashville. I went to uh, Brock's presentation on what spec writers need to know about BIM and was greatly impressed and um, thought that that would be uh, that perhaps some of the folks that uh, attend these uh, specifying practice groups might not have had opportunity to uh, see and hear that presentation or might like to hear it again. So uh, Dave and I contacted Brock and he was kind enough to volunteer to be a guest presenter today. And I'm up for hearing it again because I thought it was a great presentation. I'm glad to have you here with us today, Brock. <laughs> Glad to be here, guys. <laughs> well, Brock works for HOK, and he has uh, been in the San Francisco office now for about a year, uh, almost a year, and uh, is in charge or works with their uh, setting the quality standards for BIM there, as I understand it. Is that correct, Brock? In, in general, I, I always tell people that I'm an architect first, so I apologize for that. And then I, I get to say that I am now involved with a lot of the data management as it relates to our BIM workflow. So I started off as an architect, realized that designing wasn't my thing, as in uh, people didn't agree that I had good designs. But <laughs> I felt that I was a, a good team player, so I realized that in the supporting role uh, on the technology side was really where I was meant uh, to provide um, uh, my, my skills are essentially honed around that. So introduced to BIM almost 10 years ago, uh, I basically have, uh, have worked myself from uh, supporting projects to supporting offices uh, to now being um, a, a firm-wide resource for HOK. Well, oh, terrific. That sounds a lot like the way I got into writing specs back in 1982. <laughs> But uh, well, well, terrific. Well, go ahead, Brock. Let's let's get started and uh, and uh, do this thing. Yeah, great. And Lewis the, and I will interrupt you as we go along with the questions. That sounds great. Uh, this uh, this presentation, as was mentioned, uh, I've shared it a few times. I've even shared it to the local San Francisco chapter. So uh, the, uh, the the slides, uh, I'm going to flip through some of them uh, with more haste than others uh, because the intended time slot is a little longer than what I have today. Uh, but I do encourage you to uh, to explore the link that will be provided to you later. Uh, this is on Prezi, so it's a public uh, accessible website uh, that you can watch this whole presentation from. So the only benefit that you have with me today is the audio on top of this presentation. So uh, feel free to share it with others and uh, and explore different parts of it. And of course, the audio will be posted uh, sometime next week when uh, Matt gets it onto YouTube. And I, I do know that there's a slight delay uh, with uh, online meetings, so I, I actually have my iPad next to me so I can see what you see uh, so that I don't go too fast. I tend to go quickly through some of these slides. Uh, so uh, trust me that if I'm going quickly, it's it's uh, so that I can spend more time on the meat of the presentation. Uh, the way that I, I've presented this in the past is around the concept of Roger. Uh, in general, think of Roger as an architect turned specifier over the history of his uh, of his profession. Uh, I typically go through the history of, of how Roger uh, became a spec writer. So I'll jump through these slides fairly quickly. You can imagine there's some historical relevance to Roger in his early days in the 70s, and then again as Roger gets into the professional life of the 80s, the technology associated to that lifestyle. And as we go into the 90s, uh, Roger might have gotten into some bad habits of, of smoking and, and drinking, but you can see that the technology uh, was starting to grow uh, specifically around some technology that we're familiar with. Uh, supported by Autodesk. Uh, in, in 2000, uh, so 30 years or so into his career, 
uh, Roger was promoted into a spec writer role, and I, I do consider that a promotion not just because uh, you can now work from home and, and work 80 hours as a spec writer, but that, that there's, a, there's a knowledge basis there that I think has a lot to contribute uh, to the industry. Uh, so uh, as we move into 2010, uh, so now we're 40 years into Roger working professionally, uh, one of the things that uh, surprises Roger one day as he's going around the, the new 24-inch monitors of uh, people's screens is the fact that it's gone from a drafting environment to a drafting in the computer environment to now working with, with BIM. And that's really the source of what I'm going to talk through uh, today is what does Roger need to know now in his career of, of 30, 40 plus years in the industry, uh, his relevance uh, when it comes to BIM and how he can contribute. Uh, at, at this point, you want to take a step back and see over these uh, 30, 40 years that have passed, uh, why did this sneak up on Roger? Why were there moments uh, of this growth in technology and the way we work that he missed? And many of us missed this as well. Uh, either we were not at a a firm that was very innovative, maybe we were in a town that wasn't very innovative, or in general, the industry just wasn't quite ready for us. Uh, a few uh, years before Roger even... Brock, sure. I can remember in about 1984 how excited my firm was that I was working for in Cincinnati to get a fax machine, and how wonderful that was, and how useful it was. And is it still ironic that we still have fax numbers on our business cards as a standard? Ah, <laughs> uh, not anymore. Not us. Not my firm. <laughs> so at, at this point, I would show you a video, which I'm going to skip today, but the video goes into introducing Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad. And if you were... Uh, watching uh, PBS in 1950, you may have seen uh, a, a segment on Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad. Uh, think of this as something closer to around uh, the technology around uh, surveillance and uh, atomic bomb uh, and those kinds of things. The technology was really uh, using giant computers, using uh, a, a lot of uh, kind of forceful handed efforts to just to create uh, a simple line on a screen or a simple circle on a screen. Uh, but Ivan Sutherland's sketchpad was really what set the bar of the what we know now as computer-aided drafting. Uh, there are several videos on YouTube if you just search Ivan Sutherland or sketchpad you can learn a lot more about uh, that innovation. Uh, so that innovation led to other companies coming along to creating uh, technology like AutoCAD. Uh, Autodesk started in 1980, so around the same time that we finally have mobile phone technology and uh, boombox is, is when AutoCAD really had its uh, inception. So not to go into the uh, nuances of the history of AutoCAD, I'm sure you can talk to those guys and they can uh, at Autodesk and they can tell you more. Uh, but the, the history of AutoCAD, really starting in the 80s, uh, had a lot of quick innovation all the way up into the early 90s. Um, as we move into 1998, uh, uh, that's when they started to get into true three-dimensional technology. So we're talking about architectural desktops. So uh, kind of AutoCAD on steroids, where we're finally getting from drafting into a 3D environment. Uh, the first line of code for Revit uh, was around the same time. So interesting enough, there, there were two companies that were starting to focus on this solution around the same time. Uh, Revit's first release was in 2000, and uh, two years later is when Autodesk actually acquired Revit. So you can see the, the uh, intensity of, of what Autodesk was doing from AutoCAD to 3D, but as soon as they saw a better solution, it did not take them long uh, to acquire them as, as they do with, with many uh, technologies like this. Uh, so why is Revit a big deal? I, I don't want to get caught up in, into what Revit is or, or ArchiCAD or, or any of the other applications out there for BIM. Uh, but I think if you go back, I love doing this, if you go to the webarchive.org, uh, you can actually go to web pages that have been saved and you can go back to see what was on that URL back in the day. 
the website no longer exists today, but you can go and actually read about Revit on their website. And the thing that was really uh, uh, an important aspect of Revit in this time, thinking about 2000, uh, was the, the aspects of what they're introducing to us in the industry. And those aspects are parametric modeling and intelligent building components. Uh, these weren't concepts that we were used to hearing as architects. Uh, we're used to thinking about drafting and drafting is just representation of what I'm trying to build. What they introduced here were the concepts of parametrics and intelligent building design. All are both uh, parametric and are associated and bidirectional through high performance change propaganda engine. That's just a fancy way of saying they've solved a solution that starts to address the way architects work. Now, I, I know that this sounds like gibberish when I first start talking with a group about what is parametric. So. Uh, if you are, are like many spec writers, you want to do your homework, I encourage you to check out Daniel Davis's blog if you want to see the history of parametrics. But for those of you that are architects at heart and are really lazy, the short of it is change. Uh, you change one thing and it changes another. It's, it's the puppet string of, of how a puppeteer works. So the, the aspect of being able to manage change in the architecture profession was a huge breakthrough. Uh, in the drafting world, if I made a plan change, I would have to update 9 to 10 to 30 other drawings just because I made that change. So the idea of, of uh, parametric is so that when I make one change in the plan, it's updating my wall sections, it's updating my elevations, it's updating in other parts of my drawings. This was really, really shattering in, in our industry. The other aspect was object-oriented. Now, what does object-oriented mean? Uh, when you think about BIM as in a representation of the built environment, what we're talking about is a door actually knows it's a door. And what I mean by that is it's no longer uh, two lines on a drawing that represents uh, the actual panel in the swing. It actually knows that it must exist in a wall. If there is no wall, there can be no door. With the door, uh, once, uh, if the wall gets deleted, the door gets deleted with it, as it would in a construction environment. So the, the idea that an object in a technology, uh, in a software, can actually have some, some uh, relationships to other objects is what object-oriented means. Uh, so we're talking about two things now, the parametric aspect of, of being able to make multiple changes, and then the aspect of object-oriented. So those two concepts, uh, as, as earth-shattering as they were in the, the 2000s, 14 years later, we're kind of expecting that out of the technology now. But one of the things that, uh, that uh, has happened over the years is everyone has now got this notion of, I understand it, it's old, I, I'm familiar with it, I've gone to the conferences, I've seen the webinars, and now everyone is an expert on, on BIM. And now everything is going to be in the model. I heard one guy say it's all in the model, and I shared that with my friend, and he shared it with his friend, and the whole Twitter feed can happen. And I'm here to, to try to clarify some of this. Um, it's not all in the model. It's not all experts. There is not an equal slated level of BIM that everyone understands and knows. In a lot of ways, we are still back in the year 2000, where we're discovering a lot of these things for the first time. And, and some of these concepts might be earth-shattering. Now, in, if you're like Roger, you might be having another question moment here. What does this actually mean for me in the industry? How does uh, these, these changes in the way that we, we work affect the, what I do? So um, this, Brock, to me, is a simple way. Sure. Question. Um, I just... Um one of the things that we run into at our office is varying expectations by owners. That, uh, you know, it's kind of give me some of that BIM stuff, but they don't understand what they want or need. And, and all of a sudden, you know, before they didn't question us about what were on the, what the, the drawings were like physically and technically. But uh, now all of a sudden, uh, there are demands, and some owners are even uh, writing um, uh, extensive BIM requirements 
uh, for projects? They, they are, and I think that there are, are two reasons behind that, and I'll touch on one of them in the presentation, but the other one is when we let our marketing teams do all the selling and we don't educate our marketing teams with what we actually do. I, I've seen overselling in the market, um, both from those that sell technology and, and from, from design firms and construction firms. Uh, and it, it is a lot of the, I want to be the first one, so uh, the, the moment we think that we have that aha moment, we might be overselling some of those expectations. So uh, the opportunities when you're presented with clients who have an, an elevated expectation is, is to approach it just like you would anything else. Uh, you you want to clarify the expectations as soon as possible, and you want to validate what is possible by demonstration or by, uh, by experience level. Uh, I, I wouldn't go off to try to sell that I know how to do a certain type of architecture without having some evidence that I do. So I think the same thing is true uh, related to the technology and the outputs of, of those BIM uses. Um, so to, to clarify this, uh, I, I like to use these kind of drawings. Um, uh, we moved from drafting on the computer, so that's really nothing more than using the, the T-squares on the computer screens, to going to 3D. Uh, we've been ma making 3D models for a long time, Get back to Galileo days, we've been actually building three-dimensional representations. So doing them in the computer form is really just a digital rep representation of that 3D. Then the software got smarter. This relates to the processing power. It re relates to our internet connection speeds. Uh, so as the technology of what we use to build these kinds of things has gotten better, we're able to push the envelope further. The, these concepts of how we would use the technology have been there for the longest time. What we've been waiting for is the hardware and the software to solve some of these uh, complex issues. And our buildings have gotten just more complex. The timings have gotten shorter. The designs have gotten more challenging. So you want to keep in mind what we've been doing to ourselves, regardless of the technology, to overcomplicate some of these aspects of how we've integrated the technology. So how intelligent is intelligent? Uh, there's two parts of the way that you could argue this. Uh, the more data that I have, the better it is. But if you've ever dealt with someone else's Excel spreadsheets before, you know that that isn't always the case. Just because I have more information doesn't mean that I can make better decisions. The, the better way of thinking of this is the more reliable the data that I have is, uh, when you need it, is really the key. So knowing that I have the right information at the right time is much more valuable than just having all of the data accessible to me. I've recently started to get into the database world and I, I truly understand the difference between lots of data and a very good query. Being able to e extract the information you need when you need it is where having all of this information comes into play. Brock, wouldn't you say that some of that comes from as long as it's well-structured data that you can probably retrieve it if it's unstructured it's going to be really difficult to be able to make any use of it. That, and that goes back to even before we had computers. I, I worked for a firm in Atlanta, and my boss sold, told me on my third day as an intern that the key to organization is retrieval. And we were talking about finding uh, the right uh, ARC record. That was my job that summer, was to organize all of the architectural records they had from the first issue to the current issue so that they were in uh, chronological order so that when they needed to find a certain article uh, through indexing, they could find it. I was the librarian, if you will. So that is true, and it's been true, uh, you know, 15 years down the road into this profession. I, I found that that is a nice uh, way of thinking that the key to organization is retrievable no matter if you're talking about finding a folder or finding data within, within a database. So uh, when, when these ideas are presented to Roger, he, he has that aha moment. He realizes that uh, we need to specify what information we need when we need it. Uh, I think we've all uh, gone through the challenge before where you're issuing drawings and then they realize that we also need to issue our specifications. 
And at that time, the spec writer is then uh, unloaded on with, with all types of decisions that are now being made and all the cut sheets that now to be incorporated. Uh, and it's, it becomes a challenge to organize that and, and to present that, and it seems to be an ongoing issue. So what Roger is thinking about is if I had the information that I needed in the sequence or in the, the timing that the uh, information was being gathered, how much easier would, would my life have been as a spec writer? Well, uh, this notion of organization or decisions uh, of how much data I'm going to need along the process uh, has been the challenge uh, w related to BIM for a number of years. Uh, and when I did this presentation, uh, it was uh, just a few months prior that the, the BIM forum uh, related to the AGC along with AIA came together to come up with uh, the, the initial notion of an LOD specification. And ironically, I, I think it's interesting that they use the word specification uh, with, 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 uh, with some inclusion of, of CSI members, but in, in many ways the intention of the LOD specification uh, was to become a, a dictionary of terms because uh, in, in the growth of BIM, all of these different terminologies have started to come into place, uh, just what does BIM stand for and, and LOD and other things. Uh, the intention of the LOD specification is to be that guide so that we're all talking uh, the same language and we're using the same, same uh, terms. How the evolution of these things have come to be has gone back as far as 2008, uh, where the AIA had developed uh, the, uh, the Building Information Modeling Protocol. It's since changed numbers and names, uh, but the intention behind these documents that you're seeing on the screen here were to clarify how BIM was being used and how the data uh, was going to be transferred from one party uh, to the next. So when, when the LOD development team got together and wanted to issue what it is that we're trying to clarify, they weren't trying to address uh, the issue of uh, your BIM is better than mine or I have a higher quality BIM than you. It's taking two steps uh, earlier and to, let's just start talking along the same lines. Let's, let's define these the same way. So uh, one of the things that they've done is they created a series of levels, uh, the uh, levels of development. And if you think of these in a, in a pictorial sense, uh, the earlier uh, levels of development are very abstract. Uh, they might be aspects of shape and form. And as you go into the higher LODs, you start to get in a higher level of specificity and a and notion of knowing exactly what you can rely upon that data, down to the point where you might be using this information for construction, fabrication, in installation. So what I'm going to take a few moments here to do is explain what these LOD specification definitions are. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is not stop here. Go and actually download the LOD specification from the BIM Forum website. It's free to download. It's free to observe. And if you disagree with anything in that, join those committees to improve upon those definitions because we're only going to improve upon the, the conversations if we can have more voices in the room. The thing that I want you guys to walk away with, if there's only one thing that you remember, is the intention of the committee that has developed this specification is that LOD stands for Level of Development. And I'll clarify the differences between uh, detail, which is, which is what the earlier terms were by AIA and what other people have used in the past, and what development is. Think of level of detail as how much detail you have. Uh, we would think of this in, in terms of uh, drawings. When I looked at drawings at an SD set, there's a certain amount of detail at my quarter inch. When I go into DD, I should have more detail, and as I move into CDs, it should have a highest level of detail. When we think of level of development, we want to think of that as degrees to which project team members may rely upon. So this is the reliability part. This is where I can trust that what I'm seeing can be relied upon for this particular use. I, for example, I can rely on the, the room tag in the drawing to represent 
what that room is actually called. That's something that I can rely upon. As it relates to BIM, we might start relying upon the quantity of concrete that is going into a pour based on the floor that's being modeled in a certain geometric way. I'm relying upon that information for cost estimating. So in any association, you want to uh, correlate the level of development, reliability, to its use and, and intended use of that information. So starting off at LOD 100, this is the, the first level of, of that system. This is where we're representing things in a very generic way, symbology-wise. Uh, we understand that a, a straight line and a curved line represent a door in plan. We would then have aspects of what that generic representation would be within a BIM environment. Taking it to the next level up, in the example here, we're looking at a steel column. I know that that representation of a square uh, in my plan or, or a, a, uh, a volumetric kind of rectangle, I can trust that it is a column at 100. At 200, I start to see the difference between it being steel versus concrete. I might have some understanding of its orientation. The location might be more precise because it's tied to a grid line, those kinds of things. As we go to level 300, I start to increase my uh, representation. I might know more about that steel. I know what its yield is. I know what its uh, quality of a manufacturer's steel it's coming from. I might actually know more about the quantity, the tonnage, those kinds of things that relate to understanding the, uh, the aspects of the LOD. Again, if I'm trying to do this from an estimating standpoint, I'm curious about what its weight is. So I would want a level 300 notion of its weight so that I can use it for cost estimating. As we go into level 400, it goes too far. So the team has actually incorporated a level between 300 and 400, calling it 350. This was important to kind of add that layer of clarification where we start to integrate with multiple systems. You're seeing here the column is starting to interact with the footing. So the relationship between systems relies upon other systems. So this notion of 350 is saying that when other systems interact with each other, we have a certain level of reliability between the two pieces as they interact together. When we get to level 400, uh, this is where we get into the level of development where I can be fabricating it, assembling it. I can order this part and piece. I can put my cash on the table because I know I'm getting this in as my expectation. I like to correlate LOD uh, 400 to when I purchase things on Best Buy. I know that I've done my research, I've read the specifications, I understand that it's going to take five to seven business days, and I'm ready to purchase that item. That's where I consider LOD 400. Now, the level 500 is in the notion of uh, conversation, but in many ways, this is after it's been constructed. This is where you would be able to go in and field verify that what the intended purchased item at 400 is actually in the field. So the notion of 500 in a design should never be present. We would never get to a level 500 in the design world. That's in the post-construction world. Now I talked about several different levels. But what do all of these LODs actually mean? Now, th this is, again, probably the second most important thing that I want you to leave from the presentation. The first one was understanding LOD stands for level of development. The next one is there's no strict correlation between LODs and design phases. For example, there's no such thing as an LOD SD model or an LOD 300 model. There's no correlation to an actual model to LODs because what we're talking about with LODs are the parts and pieces of the design intent within a BIM. I can have an LOD 200 for my columns, but a level 300 for my curtain wall. 
and they can be in the same model. So having different parts and pieces at different LODs is what your real expectations are within the modeling environment. Now the question is, who do you have specifying your LODs? If you're a firm that's been working with them for a while, having this true understanding is important. And then delegating that to someone on your team to specify these is the next step that you want to start thinking through. Now when we think about in a team environment, we've got people who are responsible for doing the model planning. That might be an architectural technician. We've got people who are managing the deliverables. That might be a project architect. Uh, coordinating the specifications naturally should be a spec writer. And then the project uh, expectations with the client is really where the project manager comes into play. Now the truth is all of these team members are working together to specify that LOD expectation. So there's lots of tools to our disposal as it relates to specifying the LOD. Without setting your LOD expectations, you're really fishing and hoping that you're designing to some expectation that your client or your constructing team members have. If the LOD is too low, then people are going to be upset with you. If your LOD is too high, you might be exposing yourself to too much risk. So you want to correlate based on your fees, based on your insurance plans, how much you're willing to compromise within your LOD expectations and how much you're willing to uh, share along that process. So when you bring the whole team together, you hear all of those potential concerns. You hear the concerns of a structural engineer wanting to, to specify his LOD expectations to a certain level. The fabricating curtain wall uh, team member might want to have a different expectation. You bring all those team members together and you start to draft out your initial expectations. This is where the AIA E202 document came into play. So this document ties together the LOD, or the expectations of your development, with the modeling author. So the modeling element author would say, I am the structural engineer, and for steel columns, this is my LOD expectation during this phase of delivery. Now I'm not going to go into all the different types of delivery models. Uh, we've got several on, in the industry now. And each one of these would potentially have a different expectation based on those delivery methods. So this, this graph, this Excel file, is often overlooked within people's documentation. Uh, the great thing for us as CSI members is that most of this documentation is already organized into uniformat. It, it really is in uniform for two reasons. That's really where uh, the estimating technology and the estimators in the world are working. And it also is an easier way of organizing the content within your model environment because the uh, assembly codes, uh, that's the term within Revit, or the, the uniform at codes that we're talking about here correlate to the objects or the intended deliverables of each of these aspects, whether you're talking about interior, exterior walls, doors, and so forth. Uh, we've also got a great resource in uh, the PRM with, again, understanding what those expectations are uh, within the environment. The big thing that I learned when I took my uh, CDT uh, studying uh, seriously is that there are obviously two parts to our construction deliverables. There's the specifications, and there's our drawings. Now, in this BIM world that we're living in now, some of our specifications might actually be coming from a database. Some of our drawings might be coming from a database-driven model. Now, the notion of that information, <coughs> excuse me, could be specified. It could be correlated into an additional document like these uh, E202 documents. But in general, you have an expectation of what your deliverables are. And in today's age, that deliverable is going to be in a paper form. Today we are delivering, uh, 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 we're actually working on a, a giant project right now that has 4,000 pages for the specifications. So the, the, the way that we're delivering, let me actually get some water really quick, sorry. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
<clears throat> Sorry about that. So the, the way that we're delivering projects now is in a paper form. But that doesn't mean that we want to start thinking about the way that we're going to be delivering projects in the future. And that's where the, the conversation of BIM should be happening in your offices today rather than waiting until tomorrow. Uh, Brock, we're, yeah. also, we're already finding that um, many times the contractors are requesting access to our models, not so much as, not obviously as a contract document as such, but as information that they can use to uh, do their part of the getting the process of getting a building built. Sure, and, and that's that's an important uh, conversation to have, especially when you might be dealing with uh, external team members that uh, are on your project sooner. We're, we're seeing even subcontracting MEP engineers on jobs before drawings are actually issued. So the, the team structure, the, the correlation of information, it's a, it's a constant changing game. Uh, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is the use of that data. So when, when you get an expectation from a, a, a contractor to say, I'd like to get your, your BIM, I want your model, you want to understand, okay, what is the intended use? Intended uses has been defined by Penn State's uh, BIM ex uh, Execution Planning Guide. Uh, the BIM Execution Planning Guide has been absorbed into a lot of these conversations of BIM uses and is being incorporated into some national standards here very shortly. So understanding what the use of that BIM is, is the, the thing that you want to agree upon. You can use my model for this purpose at this level of development, meaning at this level that you can rely upon. You can use my model to do quantity takeoffs to count the number of doors I have so that you don't have to manually count them in your plans or rely upon a nine-page Excel spreadsheet of all my doors. That would be a conversation you could have and a clarification you can make because in your LOD at the schematic design, you might determine that your LOD for your doors is at a level 200 where you can rely upon the quantity. That would be a, an expectation. You could say you couldn't rely upon my doors at a level 300 because I haven't determined which ones are going to be uh, wood versus metal, which ones are going to be rated, so you wouldn't be able to purchase those doors yet, but I can at least get you started. Those are the conversations that you're going to want to start to have because there's several different ways that you can actually use a model or you can use a BIM. You can use it for data management. You're wanting to understand all the aspects of a room, the, the light levels, the, the, uh, the energy requirements, those kinds of things. You might be using it for quantity takeoff so that you can start purchasing things and you want to do cost modeling to determine what drywall cost in California today is a lot more than what it cost uh, six months ago. You also might use it for uh, conflict resolution or clash detection. So each of these uses are things that you would want to incorporate into your conversations with those that are planning on relying upon your BIM. Brock, do you think that going forward, because you were talking about the paper delivery which we're stuck in today, uh, and segregating the documents by specifications and drawings, you think maybe we not to be changing the uh, the paradigm maybe just a bit and referring to graphic and non-graphic data because I, that's that's really where we're going if we're heading down the electronic path. I I agree. I I think uh, we still have a majority of municipalities that in order to get to your permit have to issue paper drawings. That's where we are currently at. Uh, we do have some parts of the world, uh, in London, for example, and in Singapore, where models are actually required, and what models are used for uh, analysis of code analysis and other things. So I think the, the paradigm shift is, is happening uh, just like it happened in 2000, and we didn't realize it for eight or nine years. If we want to be ahead of that and start thinking of, of how we want to resolve that, we have to start getting our insurance involved, our lawyers involved, 
uh, we have to start thinking about how to write our uh, our uh, our actual contracts in such a way that we're protecting ourselves. Uh, but in many ways, our deliverables today in the paper environment is one of the reasons why we are one of the least efficient parts of our industry as far as getting things built. Uh, you, sh you can definitely see this in the car industry where you will not find paper drawings uh, in the car industry. They've gone direct from digital to fabrication in a matter of moments because they have already cut that part out of their inefficiencies. So if we were to start to deliver images like this in a digital environment where the intention of how things might be assembled going into that means and methods because our team members are now including those on the fabrication side, you can understand that our deliverables could be entirely different than they are today. Our teams could be different. The a notion of a integrated project delivery still gets smirks, but in many ways when you look at some of these large companies like AECOM and others where they have everything in-house, there's no reason why you couldn't see a project team like that actually delivering nuts to bolts everything uh, and, and moving into a P3 format where they might even be financing it for the first 10 years. This is starting to happen in a lot of public projects in Canada and other places around the world. So how we deliver our projects uh, is really just a matter of how much are we willing to uh, either provide an additional service at an additional expense or provide a higher quality of a deliverable uh, than what we're currently uh, providing. Uh, Brock, in, we have in, in many it's Go ahead. We have a question from uh, TJ Gottwald. Um It says, um, what about the AGC's uh, BIM addendum in terms of a contract document being used to manage the BIM process? That's taking it the next step further. That's taking these these documents of, of LOD and uh, and actually incorporating it into contractual obligations. So what you're talking about is you said you're going to deliver a door at a level 200 during schematic design on July 15th, and now it's July 16th, and your doors don't have uh, the 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 information that I need to to actually purchase them. So the 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 conversation is now moving towards uh, turning some of these initial requirements for better collaboration into contractual obligation and if you are on the the weaker end of that contract you actually might find yourself getting into obligations related to your deliverables that are already at a level that other companies are providing because this is expectations that they've been thinking about earlier than your team might have and are starting and to incorporate that into their deliverables. Uh, one of the things that we, we deal with a lot is, is uh, timing. Uh, we, we're, we're in a fast-paced uh, world, and, and the expectations of having your contractor on board earlier usually is sold to the client so that they can actually get into their facility sooner. And in order for them to get into their facility sooner, decisions have to be made sooner. Conversations about LOD and others have to happen sooner. So in, in many ways, the moment you get that contract signed, it should be the same week that you sit down with your team and determine the expectations of what your LOD is going to mean. And like I said earlier in the earlier slide, you want your architectural technicians, you, you want your, your drafting modeling team to be in the same room as your project managers who are agreeing upon contracts and your project architects that are determining your timelines and your specifiers that are want to be incorporated into the, the design process as well. All of these things, I think, are needing to be uh, moved further down into our discussion to I, that kind of leads me into the, the conversation of what uh, Patrick McClaney has been uh, sharing for years, where uh, the, the BIM workflow in many ways, the intention, whether we actually follow it or not, the intention is that we're actually having these conversations sooner so that we can make a better impact on cost and we can actually make these decisions with less effort. So th this effort curve, this, this diagram, if you will, the intention behind this diagram is to illustrate abstractly that there really has to be more time spent earlier on in your project because that's when you can make the best decisions that impact cost in the greatest way. 
We couldn't do this in the drafting environment. We had to spend the majority of our time drawing in the construction document phase where it's already too late. And when we go through those painful moments of value engineering, it's usually during or after construction documents. But if you can go through the value engineering effort during the design development phase, you can start making decisions about what type of exterior uh, cladding the building's going to have based on early estimating analysis because you have shared your model with your contractor to do quantity takeoffs based on what you've modeled. Then these things start to correlate together to spending more time and honestly potentially more of your fee structure during that design development phase and, and tell the, the designers to put their pencils down uh, as you go into CDs so that you really are truly documenting our, the design intent. Too many times we, we, we tend to use that CD phase to catch up on what we didn't make decisions on, but the intention of using BIM in its most effective manner is actually designing and, and making those decisions sooner so that you can benefit from this uh, parametric and object-oriented workflow. So taking that kind of full circle back to Roger, uh, what he's saying is we need to specify the information we need when we need it. So what we're talking about with LOD is if the future of the industry is moving from paper delivery to model-based delivery, then we need to set the LOD requirements for those models. So who better in our industry to start having those conversations of what the expectations of, its, of the model uh, uh, development than someone who's been specifying this type of level of information for 40 years. That's where Roger comes into play. And to me, this is the future of where a specifier with years and years of experience can start to benefit a project team. We will always need someone to specify who in your company is specifying those LODs. If we were to look over Roger's shoulder onto the screen, we're realizing that there's a lot of experience that Roger has. And how can he transfer that knowledge down to that young intern who's really good at modeling, but maybe not very good about knowing what level of development they should be providing into their BIM. Taking those BIM gurus out into the field and showing them in actual construction environments what they're modeling and how it actually gets constructed improves the quality of what's in your model. Showing them that during this construction phase, this is where they're expecting to get this information. This is why the steel fabricators need your uh, grid lines at this phase, because this is how long it takes for steel to be fabricated and erected. You want to show the LOD in the real world to those that are working in the model environment. And Roger is the person who's fully capable of doing that. So including yourself in the conversation, in the BIM conversation, to say, I understand the construction process. I understand the fabrication requirements, the testing involved, all the things that we know from a specifying standpoint or have value, and when to incorporate that into the parts and pieces of your, your BIM is what I wanted to stress through this presentation. Your understanding of LOD is important, and I encourage you to go back through that uh, documentation and become an expert on it, because it is your job in the future uh, to start to specify the LOD is on your team with the rest of your team. So again, one day Roger looked over the corner, but he was ready for that conversation to talk about them. Thanks for the present uh, opportunity to present with you guys, and uh, if you have any other questions, you can definitely reach out to me via Twitter or uh, through Google. I have a Gmail account there, and I encourage you guys to start drinking the Bim Kool-Aid if you haven't already. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks very much, Brock. That was uh, I I enjoyed it even more the second time. You picked <laughs> up on new things, so this is great. And um, I I there was a lot of information presented, so I'm hoping that everybody that's on the line might even take advantage of the recording, download it, and look at it again. And share it with other people in your offices. Right. I, I think you make some excellent point that the specifier is actually in a great position.
to be able to influence what's going on with uh, LOD and the BIM development. Because I, I can say personally from the models that I do receive that often the data, the non-graphic information is sorely lacking or just out and out wrong. Uh, and that, that will really be a hindrance uh, trying to take any kind of BIM forward and into um, the construction or handing it over to the contractor. And it's it's a simple document, the, the LOD, uh, MEA kind of clarification of LOD at certain phases to certain components in the building. It's a very simple document, but it's often overlooked. And if you if you come to an agreement on those documents, it becomes your ammunition later on in the conversations that you have with your contractors and other team members. So uh, having agreement on those things also prevents you from over LODing your content. Uh, being able to download content off of a manufacturer's website for convenience could put you into harm's way if you end up having more information in that model that you didn't specify. It's entirely appropriate to have a light fixture that you downloaded that has the manufacturer's model number if your LOD says you can only rely upon that light fixture for quantity and location. So the LOD uh, prevents the overuse of the data that could be in your model. Um, Brock, we have a quick question from Larry Whitlock who asks, who is responsible for entering properties into model objects, the modeler or the spec writer? It's typically determined based on the model element author. You can drill down to the model element author to, to great um, specificity, but in t the intention is that your spec writer would then be helping to incorporate who and how much of that information would be specified inside of the model. So in many ways, it's probably going to be your architectural technician or your architects that are loading the data into the model, but the spec writer would then be determining and agreeing upon, at this phase, you should have this much information in these components based on your uniform classifications. But uh, we had a, a question that was sent to us uh, before <coughs> the presentation started. Is, asking about, well, uh, junior folks uh, who may not know what they're doing are going to put things into the model that may be erroneous. Uh, just today, or yesterday, I was checking, doing a QC uh, review, and um, they had modeled an overhead coiling door, which I think is correct, but had noted it as an upward acting sectional door. So I don't know what information they actually what attributes they they uh, attached, but if, obviously there's a disjoint there between the note that appeared on the drawing and what the object really is. Yeah, and and, and we've never had our specs not correlate well with our drawings, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I, I think, my jobs. <laughs> I I think the opportunity there is to go back to your your uh, your LOD decision and say at this phase what information can you rely upon in the model and if the, the model uh, has the right uh, geometry then you could rely upon it at a level 200 if the model attributes say that it's a coiling door and say that it's uh, of a certain manufacturer or type then you could say that the model is correlating that information now the drawings could always be misspelled. The drawings can always be drafted incorrectly. But as we move into a future deliverable, it's really going to be about the, the data that has relevance and less about the 2D representation in the future. Now, if you were to argue today that our deliverable based on our expectations as professionals, the lawyers are going to say it's going to be based on the drawings because that's our standard of care today. So that argument of, of the modeling it correct, but noting it wrong in today's legal battle, the drawings of what was noted is what would be considered true. Right, but Brock, don't you think too, in, with the capabilities that are there uh, with BIM software, that now we can schedule that kind of information, yes. and as a specifier, that's what I tend to do, to look to see how accurate the information is. 
So or or a, a tag that reads the live data from the attribute. So there wouldn't yeah. be any text and leaders. It would just be tags and schedules. Right. But I, you can almost instantly see some, some of the issues where the data may be incorrect if you can schedule the information. That's entirely true. So we had a couple more questions show up. Uh, let me see. Here's one from uh, George Everding. Uh, who among the millennials is going to take Roger's place? Do we have younger people interested in gathering the general information that Roger gathered over his career? Well, it's it's a great question, uh, George. Uh, who who wants to take on this responsibility? In in my uh, opinion, I think we have to change the question. Uh, instead of asking the the millennials or the younger generation if they want to be spec writers, we want to ask them: Do they want to host and control the data? Because the data is really where the future of the industry lies. Uh, I really wish that I had taken more uh, computer-based and, and, and I, I wish I learned a little bit more about databases when I was young. The, the difference is they already know a lot about technology. What they don't know is uh, the, the information that needs to go within that. So the, the millennials need to learn about the information and those that have the information have to learn how to disseminate it and share it. And that can happen in a series of different ways. It can happen through uh, great mentoring relationships. It can happen through uh, the, the teaching on a school level. Uh, in general, the, the millennials are, are short on their knowledge of experience. And those that have the experience are short in their ability to share it. So to me, the, the future is when we can tie these millennials with those that have the experience in that shared environment. And to me, the, the opportunity lies in uh, having those kind of BIM conversations as a team environment, setting those LODs and having the conversations of what data should go into an actual model to me is the first step. Now, many of that information isn't always going to be in the model today, but it could be in the future. Uh, I think what we're missing is great spec writing software that can tie into our modeling technology. Uh, but before we know it, it's going to be here, and we're going to need to start to aggregate that information. So if you get the younger generation interested in managing the data, then it's not about writing a three-part spec anymore. It's about adding the right information to the right time within the, the right process of that modeling environment. OK. Uh, for all of those on the call with us today, we're up against our hour's time. And I'll ask Brock. We are generating a lot of questions at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to ask Brock if he's willing to stay on for a bit longer, and we can try to address the questions. Uh, for those of you that are committed to the hours time frame, we understand, and if you want to jump off, that's, that's fine. But if you're wanting to continue to listen to some of the questions and answers, please hang in there with us. So, Brock, are you willing? Do you I, have the time? I, I definitely, I, I'd be happy to stick around, yes. Okay. So we had, we had a number of questions come in, and, and this one more a comment uh, from Scott Anderton. Uh, who's saying, as a specifications consultant, you know, all of this becomes problematic. I'll need a bigger club to get my cl uh, to get my clients, the project architects, to ask the questions. I don't know if you have a comment about that. Um, maybe just a comment on the state of affairs here. Um, Ty Russell asks, "What about?" BIM connected specs where BIM database components create the spec table of contents? It sounds like a very specific question about uh, the technology. And I, I think in many ways, um, we haven't seen the spec writing technology evolve because we haven't changed our deliverables. Uh, our, our standard deliverables have been a three-part spec. So most of the spec writing software has continued to gear towards delivering a three-part spec. Until our spec writing software is requested to be designed to actually push and pull data effectively into the modeling environment through several different types of technology, whether it's, it's using an Autodesk product or a Bentley product, um, I think that is where we need to start asking the question is where does the data need to be? 
what information uh, and how do I collect it. In, in many ways you could actually argue that a Google document uh, form is a good spec writing technology because it can go directly into a database that can be tied directly into a model and that's a free technology. Now I think many ways the, the spec writing industry because again it's a three-part uh, driven organized uh, deliverable uh, we're really talking about word processing and how can we better word process things but um, I think that's that's uh, that's not forward thinking enough of how we can actually push this data further into the life cycle of a process. Okay, thanks. We have uh, one question from Dave Metzger. Uh, uh, what is the bigger issue today preventing fuller acceptance of BIM? Limitations of current technology or the developing the process of who does what, when? I, I think it's the latter. I think what we need to do is ha start asking the questions of how can we improve our process and make that voice loud and clear and unified and let the technology respond to that. Too many times we change our process based on the, uh, the available software that we can afford. I can only afford AutoCAD because I'm a poor architect is, a, is no longer a good excuse anymore why you're not working in, in a BIM environment. So if, if we need better tools, we need to, as a collective group, start arguing, this is how I want to deliver projects, these are the expectations that my clients have, and push that back to those that we're, we're, we're giving our money to that's providing our technology to us. Okay. Thanks, Brock. You're doing great on these questions, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Ty Russell. Uh, BIM connected specs allow checking model and specs against each other for accuracy. Have you had any experience with that, Brock? Well, you can do a series of things. Uh, if, if you're talking about uh, a BIM environment, you could develop a, a field or a parameter in your environment where you're tying an attribute uh, to your elements that might be codified in the LOD of the expectation. You could then manage that using a, a schedule or, or, or cost or um, a model checking technology like a Solibri or something to check against your expectations. Uh, it, there's a little bit of work in that, that aspect, but many companies out there are starting to do this where they're uh, adding the, the, expect, uh, the, the expectation of the LOD to the element itself and then cross-referencing that through reportings uh, to actually see if, in fact, that is being met. Uh, a good example of that is you might have a matrix where at LOD 300 these six parameters need to be filled out and you can easily check against that using some rules to say if my model is set to this LOD but is missing some of those check boxes or is missing some of this data then you have failed essentially with that specific check. Okay. Lewis, you want to take some of these questions? I see we were reminded by Tommy Smith that he submitted one early on. Yeah, I told him I wasn't sure that we could uh, get to it. Um, he had asked, uh, um, how does uh, BIM affect the traditional roles of owner, designer, and constructor? And I think beyond role, he actually means the interrelationships. I, well, I, I think the, the relationships are always changing. Many of the relationships are changing because we laid off so many great architects a few years ago and now they work for contractors. <laughs> so they're asking the right questions now because they're on the other side of the team. Or um, working for real estate companies. Or working for so owners. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's where some of these contracts are starting to come from is, is some of the, the uh, disgruntled architects that are trying to stick it to people. <laughs> but I, I think in, in many ways uh, the conversations are, are changing because the, the people asking the questions are different. So, um, but do, do you see a, a possibility of uh, we might have a sophisticated owner that, for example, we draw, we put a, a wood door object into the model. Right. And the owner might say, have uh, a uh, purchasing national purchasing arrangement with one of the major door manufacturers. And so someone from his staff might actually attach the attribute of that this is, you know, a, uh, a certain brand door and it's uh, 
you know, it's a cherry veneer that's uh, got a clear finish on it and no stain, um, that they might actually have input into the information that's attached to objects. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that the future of uh, model aggregation and model sharing will lead to that. I think eventually everyone will be on an iPad and they'll be one click away of getting to all the information at once. Now, whether they're uh, an author of that information uh, and whether when they off when they provide authoring to that, if that starts to remove liability off of the architect, uh, it starts to raise some some questions there. That the the moment that changes are being made, maybe that's associated to an additional fee. Uh, you could easily make uh, each client change a uh, single click fee exchange to your Bitcoin account or something if you wanted to. <laughs> um, I, so I, I think there's there's potential uh, fee structures that will start to change as well uh, when we start to change the, uh, the way that people can aggregate their information together. Uh, architects tend to host a lot of this information and a lot of the risk. Uh, but are not being compensated uh, as it relates. And I think that's just because architects are poor business people at, at heart. That if this uh, notion of incorporating more people and more decisions together uh, actually increases uh, or decreases risk, uh, then I think the, the translation of a fee structure might be into play. We can't just rely on uh, so many hours per sheet to set our, our time and to set our fees anymore. Okay, we only have a couple more Brock, so we're coming down to the end of this. But, um, Ron Lincoln asked, does Roger regulate, or yes, does Roger regulate the extent of vendor inserted object attributes that get passed through to the model, or do the LODs regulate that? I, I think it, it again comes down to the decisions of what your reliable information is set to. So if, if you are setting your LOD expectations uh, to a certain level where you're going to start using some of that vendor provided information, then you will start to rely upon that. But if you never set the expectation to rely upon it, if you set your expectations low, then you might not ever benefit from some of that added attribute information. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a decision-making uh, that you have to make, and the decisions can change. I think the benefit of the LODs not being part of a uh, contract is it gives more freedom for teams to use it as a communication tool. So you might find that as we move into a certain phase, uh, the, the going to the door conversation earlier, uh, the, we might find that the owner has a relationship with a door manufacturer. They have a fixed rate for the unit cost of those doors. So we might skip a whole bunch of, of, uh, of uh, submittals. We might be able to skip a whole bunch of uh, quality uh, issues, uh, issues that we would have historically if we say, okay, talk to your vendor, give us your uh, families, your Revit content that we'll put in our model from your vendor and we're going to eliminate this submittal and we're going to eliminate this other um, cost estimating exercise because we're going to add the fixed unit cost into the model and we'll use that moving forward. With a certification that the contractor is actually going to provide what the model says. Precisely. It's, it's all a matter of agreeing upon what that LOD reliability would be. If the, if the contractor can agree that they're going to use the quantities and they're going to use the unit cost provided by the uh, owner's representative through their relationship, uh, you, you might be able to eliminate a lot of hours of, uh, of, of estimating and uh, you know, compromising uh, if, you can, if you can start to add that. And if that trickles into light fixtures and it trickles into uh, doors and, and, uh, and, and even carpet purchasing and other things, you can see where some of this starts to play into future uh, BIM uses. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I may have skipped this one. Um, oh, a pointed one to you, Brock. So when does HOK involve the, involve the spec writer in a project? Well, I, I will say this, uh, that all of the, the comments and everything that I've shared is of the opinion of my own and does not represent the, uh, <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> the, the, the work of my company that I represent. 
and uh, in, in general, uh, most of my opinions about BIM and its use doesn't always correlate to the 26 uh, in 1,800 people that work for HOK. Uh, and to be honest, I don't actually work on projects directly anymore, so I can't uh, give you with, uh, with great uh, faith that um, w the way I think that things should work are actually working on, on, on projects because I'm not actually working on projects. I'm more of an advisory role. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is reach out to our spec writers directly and, and ask them uh, to, to share how their process was and how it is now because we do have uh, constant changing teams within our spec writing group. Uh, a lot of sharp people we've added recently. So I think uh, in, in terms of how HOK does things, it's always going to be a, a moving target based on which office you talk to that relates to uh, which uh, municipalities they work in and, and what the country's regulations are. Uh, we might see our spec writers in London moving closer in that pendulum swing because of the governmental requirements of them where we might not see that in some other parts of the country. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Michael White asked, "How does all of, uh, how does Kobe fit into all of this?" That's a great question. Kobe is nothing more than a format of how data is transferred out to another technology that could be used on a facility standpoint. So when people are asking for Kobe formatted data, they're really asking for when I export from my data to your data, it's in a certain format. So one of those things that's included into a Kobe format is things like a height and width of an equipment, the manufacturer, make and model. In, in many cases, uh, what most uh, construction teams are doing is they're exporting out of a model environment to an Excel because it's easier to manage that from a data standpoint. And as things are being purchased in the field, they're putting in that information in that Kobe format so that when they provide that Excel file that's in that Kobe format to the owner, they can import that into their facility management technology and they know the warranties, they, they know uh, the, uh, the information about their equipment to a very high level of development. Okay, and we're down to the very last one. So who do you find is best to keep the model up to date during construction? The contractor or the consultants? I think it comes down to whoever is willing to take on the risk and to take on the potential um, uh, profit. Uh, I think there's a business model here that it makes sense in the future for architects to take on some of that responsibility for potential repeat work. You can imagine if the architect designed the building and they were to update it during construction, they're very uniquely positioned for renovations to that construction for future projects. And being able to retain that data on an archiving basis at maybe an annual fee, I'll hold your records and I'll keep it up to date every time you make a, uh, a minor modification to your project gives a business model opportunity for architects. Contractors, on the other hand, have the benefit of updating a model so that they can, during construction, uh, compare that against what their strategy is to completing construction. So they're able to use it as a quality management tool. So I think the future of a, a true working environment is for both the architect and contractor to work in tandem. So keeping that model up to date during construction so the contractor can benefit uh, with the quality management of the project and the architect can benefit by having a final product that they can then use for long-term strategies. And the owner can benefit for facility maintenance. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. Okay, we came to the end of the questions, Brock. Thanks for hanging in. And You're quite thanks welcome. to everybody else who's still on the call here today listening. Uh, I think it was one of the more valuable programs that we've had, Brock, and I really appreciate your time. I'm yes, glad thank I can you. Help. Thank you very much, Brock. Um, everybody keep in mind that uh, next month is we will be meeting on uh, the 4th of December, the first Thursday. And uh, uh, David and I will put our heads together uh, virtually pretty soon and come up with uh, a subject. And uh, I think Brock raised a lot of issues that we'd like to hear more from him. So maybe uh, early in the new year we can persuade him to uh, join David and I for another presentation. So keep the cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors, and we'll see you next month. Talk to you next month. Okay. So long now.